What does INEC need in terms of legislation to be able to uh, perhaps perform a little better than uh, it's, um, although we're still expecting the ratings to come out, uh, what does INEC need in terms of legislation that will help improve your performance? Or do you subscribe to the uh, submissions by some, even Samson Itodo himself, that INEC needs to be unbundled or decentralized, if you will? <sighs> I guess you'll have to look at each segment, each sector, uh, individually, and then comment on that. But um, we honestly must ask ourselves certain questions and we must be prepared to challenge certain systemic issues that just, it's not because it's INEC, it's because of inherent systemic faults that we have within the system. Why do I say this? Um, let's take the Electoral Offense Commission. We have been at the forefront of that. Um, the argument, one way or the other, is one, do you actually need a separate um, organization, separate from the police or separate from the existing commissions to do that? Or should the responsibilities devolve on um, uh, existing agencies? People have mentioned the police, the arguments here for and against that. Uh, people have mentioned um, the Namani Committee, for example, actually referenced a separate commission to do with party registration and prosecutions. So there are different ways, but um, I, uh, our personal view and our, the Commission's official view is that, yes, the issue of um, uh, prosecution of electoral offenders should be taken to another body that will have full responsibilities to arrest, to investigate, and to prosecute. Whether that will come within the existing infrastructure of um, uh, existing agencies, that's a different issue. Or whether you want a different, separate body to deal with that, that's a different issue. Arguments have been made for registration of political parties. But whichever way you do it, I think once work, there's certain, there are certain interdependencies. Once work and the, how well it performs its role, its functions in that regard, will impact on whichever body that is left to conduct elections. So a lot of people feel that INEC should be left to just print ballot papers and conduct elections. Issue of registration of voters, we have very models to copy from. In some states, of some countries, the minute you turn 18, you automatically put on the, on, the, on the register of voters. Or in other areas, you don't have to register. All you have to do is bring some kind of uh, personal identity, like a driver's license or a passport, and you can vote. Who manages the voters' role sometimes is the electoral commission, sometimes for the people. But we must actually look at the root of all those things, see what is best for our system. It's a conversation that obviously will be ongoing for quite a while to come. Yeah, uh, uh, Mr. Osazeozi, uh, did INEC in any way preempt the uh, challenges with uh, technology? I mean, concerning the card readers especially, did you preempt that uh, such would happen in such significant quantum? Well, anything that is technological, you must make provisions for any glitches, for glitches and for uh, sometimes outright failures. We all use cell phones, and that's the basic example we often use. And you know issues about drop calls. Uh, some people use smartphones know that sometimes the phone just dials a number you did not dial or performs a function, the command of which you did not give. So yes, there are, uh, there's the real potential for that. So you must plan towards that. There must be a fallback plan. And that is why we made room for redundancies, for example. One, the redundancies will come where there's a total failure of the carrier, where it has stopped uh, performing the role it's supposed to, all the roles it's supposed to play. So that was uh, one of our plans. The other plan was to get technical teams all around every region area, every ward in this country, almost 9,000 uh, wards were staffed by some technical people who were roving, who were going around to uh, troubleshoot, to solve problems for the commission. So yes, we did plan for it. But the challenge in some areas was the fact that you recall that about 5,000 carriers, almost 5,000, were destroyed in the fire incident in our Anambra State Office. Now, we replaced those carriers. How did we do that? We mopped up the um, part of the redundancies, part of the extras. We had to mop up from just about all states in the Federation to make up for Anambra. Of course, that now left a shortage in the total um, backups that we had to service the whole uh, country because it takes quite a while for us to replace those carriers. They're not machines that are bought off the shelf. They have to be customized and it takes nothing about as, as, as much as six months to ensure you get a reasonable quantity down to us. So that is, these are some of the measures we took. Okay, uh, one more thing. A number of people have um, alluded to the fact that INEC is overwhelmed. Do you agree that INEC is overwhelmed? Well, I think yesterday showed that INEC is in no way overwhelmed. I think if you look at process issues, I think 
um, most people, all observers, have uh, commended the commission for how it handled things. A lot of the challenges we had were probably security issues and technology issues. But um, in terms of process delivery, I think the, 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 the jury isn't out. I think most people have commended uh, the commission for doing its job the way it should be done. Well, Mr. Susi, uh, there's also uh, the PVT I meant was they were talking about the uh, parallel vote tabulation mechanism which they say they deployed for the elections. That's yes. upon which uh, where he uh, raising some of these issues. He also did say he gave an example of his own particular ward, uh, his PU, PU 024 in FCT. He says there. You had some people who had their permanent voter cards, but they didn't find their names on the register. He says there were about 300 of them, and they were not allowed to vote. Yes, that's what the law says. The law says your name must be on the register for you to be allowed to vote. Um, uh, without speaking to specific issues, even on a personal level and official level, we did get some complaints. One for which we were able to solve was that the person found the name in a different uh, polling unit. I think there are two like that. One found in a different polling unit. Um, I, in one preliminary one, we, we, we looked into two people registered, one with the same surname, one transferred, but the other did not. But for some strange reason, both names were transferred to a new location. So um, I want to think that um, um, some of these issues occur. Let me acknowledge that they do occur. But 300 and something, one pulling in, that's a huge number. That really is a large number. And uh, if you avail source of that, certainly an investigation will be undertaken. But the law says you must not only have your PVC, but your name must appear on the register. Okay, and but... always encourage citizens, you can help us to serve you better. Okay. We can help, you can serve us better by... We displayed all these um, preliminary register of voters, we call it. We displayed these registers in all polling units in November last year. Please go and check. Some people just say, well, I've been voting there, so my name must be there. But things happen, and there might be loss of data, whatever, anything can happen. Please check, and for over a week, these things were displayed. So raise an objection if there's anything. So if you've been voting or you've, you've registered in a place, and your name is on that register, if you had gotten on back to us, then obviously we would have corrected this. So these are some ways that people can help us. Not only is this a statutory requirement, it's a process thing which we, we believe in and which we undertook. The loss is five days, minimum five days. We did it for about seven days. If that had been done, for example, with all these people, we could have, there's an opportunity for us to correct that before we set five registers to give to the, um, to the political parties and release to the public. So going forward, I hope that if we get those particulars, that will be investigated and rectified before the next cycle of elections. So what kind of consideration is INAI going to give to uh, where he says 17, about 17 and, or 18 polling units where elections didn't hold? In which particular locality? He says uh, uh, across the country. 17? Yes. Okay, well, we, uh, as I said, we, we did issue a statement yesterday. For example, we mentioned uh, Anambra specifically. We mentioned Lagos. We mentioned rivers. In rivers, um, whole communities did not vote because of the violence that um, I obviously some people were determined that there will be no elections in their areas. But we will regroup. We will regroup and we will go back there. But in places where it will not make any difference, in a, in a place, for example, a constituency, a central district or the presidential, if the leading candidate has, um, is ahead by, let's say, 1,000 votes, and we now see that the total number of registered voters in those communities where elections are not hold, PUs where elections are not hold, is 100. Obviously, if we conduct elections and those 100 people vote for the second, the runner-up, then obviously it will not make a difference. And we think it will be responsible and waste of funds. And in compliance with Section 26 of the Electoral Act, which says that when you postpone election because of violence or other disaster or emergency occurrence, then you don't declare a result unless you're satisfied that, that once you're satisfied that that result will not make the result in those areas, affected areas will not make a difference, then you are, you are, in light, you are entitled to um, declare a result and return a winner. So that is what we'll look at. We'll look at margins of lead. And so uh, still, still on the uh, polling unit 024 in the FCT where Samson Nitodo uh, made those observations of uh, over 300 people that uh, couldn't get to vote yesterday. Uh, he did also say that that polling unit has about 3,000 people to it. 
So I'm wondering where then does the VPS, the voting points um, uh, 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 settlement, comes in? Did you not uh, reduce that number from the huge number that was recorded in that PU? I want to think that he's being misquoted um, in the sense that um, the voting point is not part of a polling unit. There is no polling unit that I'm aware of that has 3,000 voters. Without creation of a voting point, there will be at least two voting points in that particular unit. Unfortunately, I didn't have a head start on this one. I probably would have been more specific in answering him, so I cannot um, answer him specifically except I go back and check the records. But with 3,000 people, then voting points would have been created. So he probably was talking of the aggregate of the, the – because it's still one PU, but there are voting points, at least two others, two other voting points will be there. So possibly that's what he's referencing.